Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today and welcome to our session, Plenary with Panel Rethinking the Rules. Without any further ado, please welcome our Chair, Mr. Danny Rodrik, to open the session. Mr. Danny Rodrik, the screen is yours. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are, whatever time zone you're in. Uh, welcome to um, the, the final plenary uh, session of the um, IEA World Congress. Uh, we have a very interesting uh, discussion um, to, to top off our, 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 our World Congress um, with um, two very distinguished uh, speakers, uh, Kaushik Basu, um, uh, uh, outgoing president of the International Economic Association, um, and, and Joe Stiglitz, um, uh, past president of the International Economic Association, among obviously many other things. Um, the, the topic of our discussion um, is uh, rethinking the rules, rethinking the rules uh, of the economy. And I think uh, this is a fundamental and foundational question that uh, is appropriately um, uh, very germane um, at the juncture. Um, of the world economy that, that we are in now. Um, I think our, our starting point is the, is the uh, um, uh, important um, realization uh, that, that sometimes uh, economists tend to overlook um, that uh, markets uh, are not self-standing uh, institutions that uh, sort of operate naturally on their own. Uh, markets are uh, always embedded uh, in institutions, uh, in a various sets of rules. And those institutions are needed um, to ensure that markets can exist, can function properly. Uh, those institutions regulate markets. Those institutions uh, stabilize markets. These institutions legitimize markets for society more broadly. Uh, markets are, um, uh, to use a, 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 a Polanyi-esque term, markets are embedded uh, in society in a very broad range of non-market uh, institutions. Um, and the form that those institutions take, uh, the shape of those rules, are not um, fixed. Um, they are flexible and we are constantly designing them. Uh, even something so basic as property rights uh, does not have a natural form. Uh, we can think of various different forms in which property rights can be sliced and diced and rewritten. And of course, in the context of um, uh, intangible capital, such as intellectual property rights, that's an ongoing discussion about precisely how to define what property rights for intellectual property might mean. But it's really a much broader issue uh, that there is no such thing as an absolute property right that we're always defining and redefining it uh, through a kinds of rules. And of course, that's all the more so the case when we think about the broader sets of rules, um, about regulatory uh, rules or rules about stabilizing the macroeconomy, rules about legitimizing through uh, redistribution and other um, uh, socially important uh, functions. Um, and as a result, um, uh, the, the uh, institutions of a market economy have always gone uh, transitions and transformation. Uh, the economy that we have today, the rules look very different from the type of market economy that we had um, at the height of the industrial revolution, call it Manchester liberalism, which sort of evolved into a kind of a new deal welfare state Keynesianism um, um, in, during the 20th century and then transitioned into something that for lack of a better word, we might call neoliberalism. And uh, now we're discussing what those new sets of rules are going to be. Um, I think we, it's very important to understand our agency uh, about those rules. Um, and, and just to uh, go back to our discussions, for example, on, on globalization and hyperglobalization that dominated our approach to globalization in the last uh, few decades, um, the big mistake we made was simply to assume that those rules were natural and physical and they just sort of fell on our laps, laps ready-made. Um, there are always, there's a couple of quotes from political leaders that I use um, and which seem very anachronistic, which seem very odd from our current perspective, but really reflected 
uh, the views um, uh, of that prevailed in the 1990s, 2000s, about sort of how the rules, you know, were basically fixed. Um, so we have, you know, Bill Clinton in the early 2000s, I think it was in, back in 2001, who said globalization is not something we can hold or off or turn off. It's the ec economic equivalent of a force of nature like wind or water. Um, so it's like a physical force. Around the same time, Tony Blair, uh, the British prime minister said, I hear people say we have to stop and debate globalization. You might as well debate whether autumn should follow summer. In other words, there's really nothing to debate here. It's all, you know, it's just, it's just given. It's, it's, it's remarkable this use of a physical metaphor to suggest that, that actually there is nothing we can do about the shape that globalization had taken. Whereas, of course, now we understand that uh, it's uh, not, not just that globalization is, is, is reversible, but also that it is the product of a specific set of rules um, and interests that are, are, are reflected in the trade agreements that we write and the norms that governments internalize. Um, I think there in another very important area where we need to understand that, um, that we have agency and that we, there are rules to be uh, reconsidered and rewritten is in the area of technological change. I think we're, we're making the same error often in our discussions about technological change and innovation today um, that we did in our discussion of globalization, simply taking the direction of technological change uh, as given. Um, so the tenor of our discussion today is, you know, we have all these new technologies, automation, uh, AI, new digital technologies, and that society has to adjust to these new trends, that we have to invest uh, in our um, uh, workers, we have to reskill, we have to train. When we think about all this discussion, it's all about society and labor markets adjusting to what we take to be, what we assume to be or presume to be a kind of an exogenous uh, technological change. But of course, we're constantly, uh, either explicitly or implicitly, uh, directing that technological change um, through our tax system, through our innovations, through uh, where we put our emphasis on R&D, uh, through the norms that Silicon Valley or the innovators um, have internalized. And how we can direct innovation has been very sort of vividly demonstrated uh, by um, sort of the ease, the, the, the speed with which vaccines uh, against uh, COVID uh, were developed. Uh, but also the inadequate access to vaccines um, also shows um, how um, those rules, um, the way that they're written and who they privilege matters in terms of who benefits from that technological change. So there's a much broader question about to what extent we can rewrite the rules of technological change and, and direct innovation uh, in a way that, that, uh, that, that um, benefits uh, greater segments of society and labor markets much more broadly. Uh, if we exercise our agency there. Okay, I'm just the, the actually the chair and the moderator. I don't want to take a whole lot of time on this, but these were sort of the questions in my mind. I'm, I'm sure that Joe and Kaushik are going to go much deeper into these issues. So let me just um, uh, um, ask uh, Zoom, uh, ask Joe to, um, to take the screen. Joe. Well, thank you, Danny. And that was a wonderful introduction uh, to, to what I would, wanted to say. Uh, we not only need to rethink the rules of uh, the economy, we need to rewrite them. Uh, and I've written two books uh, suggesting how, for instance, we need to rewrite the rules. One is about rewriting the rules of the American economy, and the other is about rewriting the rules of the European economy. Uh, Danny pointed out that uh, Blair and, and Clinton um, took globalization as an exact, uh, as uh, given uh, by the laws of nature. Um, but it's more than just uh, politicians. Economists uh, made the same kind of mistake. Uh, there's a, a very strong tradition in economics that uh, talks about the deep parameters of the economy, um, technology and preferences. And both of those are endogenous. Danny emphasized the nature of the endogeneity of technology, that we have human agent, uh, agency, we can steer technology. We're doing it all the time. Uh, 
by uh, tax laws and by the way government does basic research, what it encourages, what it discourages. Uh, but preferences too are endogenous. So the way I sometimes look about, uh, think about it is that uh, markets don't exist in a vacuum. Uh, they are structured by our laws, by our regulations. And so as important or more important than the laws of nature are the laws of man. One way of seeing that uh, clearly is looking at how things have changed over time and how they change across countries. Uh, if the underlying laws of nature were what were determining, say, the degree of inequality, then we should expect similar countries uh, in terms of uh, uh, the degree, you know, uh, a stage of development, the banks countries, all to have the same degree of inequality. But we see huge differences across countries in the degree of inequality. Um, so too, uh, if we look over time, uh, I don't think it's just an accident that we had no financial crises between uh, the Great Depression and 1980. Uh, at least not, no, no, ver uh, not very many. But then after 1980, we've had a rash of financial crises, over 100 uh, around the world. Again, why? It's because we changed the rules. We deregulated. We deregulated the financial system. We provided more opportunity. It wasn't as if technology suddenly changed that led to the large number of, of financial crises, it was we changed the rules. And those rules led uh, to uh, behavioral changes, and those behavioral changes led in turn to a higher frequency of uh, economic uh, down, of financial crises. The two examples I've just given illustrate that the rules have first order effects, both on economic efficiency, economic growth, economic stability, and distribution. And in fact, many of the most important distributive battles that we confront are battles fought not at the abstract level of what should be the distribution of income, we don't fight, uh, many of the battles are not uh, uh, in terms of the second welfare theorem, in terms of lump sum redistributions from one group to another, although there are uh, battles about the progressivity of the income tax. But many of the battles are much more subtle. They are about the rules. And the rules matter, for instance, for distributive uh, distribution because of how they affect information, how they affect transaction costs, uh, and as I say, how they be be affect more broadly uh, behavior. There are some contexts in which we have come to understand how rules and regulations matter, and, and, and really first order importance for our future, for instance, in environmental regulation, uh, whether uh, we will put climate change under control, whether we will have the devastating effects of climate change that are already evident, uh, whether we will limit uh, the change in temperature to one and a half, two degrees centigrade, depends on the environmental rules that will be uh, adopted by various countries and globally, uh, um, what kind of global agreements like the Paris Accord we can get in a clear sense that we need a, a stronger rules in that area. But what I want to emphasize, and I think Danny and Kaushik uh, uh, agree, is that the rules matter not just in this obvious area, but throughout the economy um, in governing 
labor markets and labor relations, product markets and areas of antitrust, um, in um, uh, uh, absolutely every aspect of our economy. And one way of seeing this is to go back to the context of the environment where we understand that rules matter and see how we are now beginning to try to get a comprehensive attack against climate change and see how that carries over to other contexts. So for instance, today in our discussions of climate change, we talk not only about a carbon price, a price uh, obviously is a, 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 um, a tax which, which affects behavior, but we talk about the regulations, not having any more uh, fossil fuel uh, burning generators or uh, demanding that all cars be electric. But we also reflect in, for instance, the disclosure requirements, requiring firms to disclose how much uh, uh, fossil uh, carbon they're putting in the atmosphere and their exposure to carbon risk and their exposure to other aspects of climate risk. Now, these disclosure requirements are important because they affect investor, they affect the investor information and therefore they affect how capital gets allocated. But they're also important because they affect behavior. By calling attention to the risk of climate change, they alter behavior. That's just one example, but there are many. If we look across uh, the spectrum of, of the rules, uh, we see over and over again how they've affected our economy. Uh, the concern, one concern about uh, one of the major sources of inequality, increase in inequality in the United States is the increase in market power. And that is a result uh, of uh, a change in the rules governing uh, antitrust done not by uh, legislature so much as by the courts as they bought into the doctrines of the Chicago School, they said markets are naturally competitive. And they focus on consumers rather than the broader nature of uh, competition in the marketplace. There's one study looking in another area of labor where uh, uh, the increases in inequality in the United States can be largely explained just by a change in uh, the laws, regulations, and their interpretation governing labor relations. The Supreme Court in this last session in the United States, for instance, uh, had a ruling about the ability of uh, unions to recruit uh, uh, members uh, in the case of a very specific case of migrant laborers who often work and live on the, pro uh, on, on, on the land uh, um, of the firm, the farm for which they work. And by denying access to those workers saying it's private property, you can't get, uh, enter that private property, recruit them, you deny uh, the ability of the union to uh, actually get them to join the union. So that undermines the power of the unions. Well, that's a very particular, very narrow example, but there are multiple examples of the way the courts operate, uh, the ease with which you could have class action suits to rectify uh, 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 imbalances between consumers and uh, firms, between workers and firms, uh, all of these shape uh, the economy, have first order effects, both in terms of uh, distribution and efficiency. So one of the important insights that this uh, approach takes is to say, for the last 40 years, 
the rules of the economy have been rewritten. They've been rewritten under a set of economic doctrines, sometimes referred to as market fundamentalism or neoliberalism, that was predicated on a, a, a set of ideas that markets are naturally efficient, that they are naturally competitive, that you need to just uh, limit the role of government. Those ideas, as influential as they were among certain circles, were not based on sound economic theory. And the irony was that exactly as those, at the time that those ideas became uh, popular, Thatcher and Reagan, uh, and those uh, following those ideas around the world, exactly at the extent, at the same time, economists were proving that the conditions under which markets were efficient were very restrictive. And uh, for instance, uh, my own work focused on uh, there had to be perfect uh, information. There had to be a complete set of risk markets. In the absence of, uh, 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 in the presence of asymmetries of information or in the presence of incomplete risk markets, uh, the economy was not in general constrained, very efficient, and there was a role for uh, government intervention. As we moved into the 21st century, reality has intruded in several ways. Uh, we become aware of the importance of climate change, an externality of first order importance. We've become aware of the growth of inequality and that actually the degree of inequality can affect aggregate economic performance. So in a sense, there are inequality, there are externalities associated with uh, inequality. We become aware that we're part of a knowledge economy. The reason we have higher standards of living today than we did 250 years ago is because of the advances in science. But knowledge is the global public good. And therefore, if we are to continue the advancement of our standard of living, we have to invest. And an efficient way of doing that is through uh, public support. The rules governing the private production of knowledge, Danny referred to these intellectual property rights, those are man-made rules. And inevitably, they are second best rules. They restrict the use of knowledge, which is inefficient, even as they may encourage the production of knowledge. But what we've realized also is that these man-made rules may actually discourage overall the production of knowledge if we don't write them right. And there is considerable evidence that we have not written those rules right. So these uh, examples of the changes in our world uh, have made it clear that the uh, rewriting, the writing of the rewriting the rules that began in 1980, that have led, contributed to both the slowing down of economic growth and the enormous increase of inequality. Uh, these that rewriting was a mistake, and so uh, I think it is time that we need to not only rethink the rules of the economy, we need to rewrite them. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. So let's go um, right away to, to Kaushik. Um, Kaushik, I think Kaushik, you're muted. I, I am muted. I'm starting once again. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Danny and Joe. Um, uh, Danny's introductory remarks actually just set the tone for what I want to go into. And I do want to refer to some of uh, Joe's work in what I will present. Let me begin with Danny's initial remark where 
there's possibility of some disagreement. I don't know if there is a disagreement. My hunch is there isn't because I'm deducing the words from having read Danny on other things, but I want to put this on the table because I hope to come back to this. I do believe that there are certain processes which are virtually natural. There's very little you can do. You have to take those as given. But much more is treated by a whole lot of professionals, including economists, as given. So there is a line somewhere between, and, and I feel we will be on the same page if we get onto the details of this, but I'm going to tell you where I stand so it will gradually become clear. But the broad thrust and direction in which I'm going to go is very similar to the line that I know both uh, Danny and uh, Joe have taken and the normative positions are very, very similar. Let me just emphasize what was being talked about, suggested by Danny in his brief remarks and Joe about certain things that we take as given, intellectual property rights. How much it should not be taken as given. To me, the most stark example of this is the early arrival of Europeans in America. The Native Americans did not have land property rights in the sense in which Europeans had and imposed on them. And there are well-documented analysis of the Native Americans, Cherokees, trying to understand what is it that they are giving up when they are signing contracts, giving up their lands. And actually it's known that they didn't understand because after signing a contract, giving away the land, few days later, they would be back again to till that land. Because to them, the notion of a property right for a land on which you till uh, uh, the soil is not the same as the ones that the Europeans were bringing. But the Europeans were, of course, bringing that along with soldiers and arms. So it was their rules that would be imposed on this. And actually, in today's world, when I look around at the new forms of rights being written, a lot of it I don't understand, but it is going to engulf us. The kinds of issues that the, um, uh, Danny's initial remarks and Joe's remarks uh, um, uh, uh, talk just now drew attention to, I think is extremely important. Very briefly on the current uh, situation, on, let, let me just say one thing about John Maynard Keynes's very famous observation in his essay, Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. There, I think Keynes made one big mistake. He took the line that the problems of the economy will be solved. In maybe a hundred years, it will be solved. That will never happen for the following reason that the economy as an organism is evolving all the time. And one of the elements of how it evolves is what the re kind of research we are doing, kind of knowledge that we are throwing up that itself changes the shape of the economy. So it's almost economics is a discipline that is analyzing a moving creature and the creature will continue to move and the discipline will have to evolve and keep pace with the movement of this creature. And we are currently at a juncture where I do fear that we may lose the battle because the landscape of the world is changing very rapidly and economics needs to catch up with it and very different ways of thinking. The analogy for this is the industrial revolution. The landscape of the global economy changed dramatically because of technology, technology being created by human beings from roughly 1750 to 1850. What, and despite the technological advance, the world could have done much worse. By the end of it, it could have crumbled by the pressures of the new system if it was not for two things, radical policies. The radical policies, the Factories Acts in the 19th century that were coming in from 1802, Robert Peel's Act to a whole set of laws, which were actually now they look normal to us. At that point of time, they look very, very radical. It is a moment of that kind, but I'm not going to dwell on the policy very much. That was also a time when we had to understand the economy in novel ways. And I think it is a stroke of luck for us that some of the biggest breakthroughs in economics more or less overlapped with the Industrial Revolution. Adam Smith, 1776, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, uh, Cournot, 1838, all this is happening 
more or less overlapping with the period of the Industrial Revolution. So by the middle of the 19th century, we are getting new rules, new laws, radical laws, and I think we need another round of radical laws, but also a much deeper understanding of the economy. We are at that juncture. Here, I want to just in many ways give shape to what was already touched on. I think in economics, in normal economics, there are axioms that we write down. Even if we don't write them as axioms, we write them explicitly as assumption one, assumption two, these are the assumptions. If you, I mean, the classic work of being written in that form is of course, Gerard Debreu's book. It's axioms and results, axioms and theorems. The whole book is that. It's the mastery of elegance that book is. Normal economics, what people do and what I've done uh, for a long time, students do when they get in, is you take those explicit assumptions and change one and see if the result survives or is there a weaker assumption with which you can keep the result going? Thus, take the assumption of uh, convex preferences or convex technology. There are many other results on if you change that assumption, what will happen? Transitivity of preference, the whole literature on quasi-transitivity. You change that axiom, what will happen? But it is arguable that our deepest assumptions underlying a discipline is so deeply embedded that very often we forget that those assumptions are sitting there. Those are not the stated assumptions. And I believe now that all disciplines will invariably have unstated assumptions or what you may refer to as assumptions in the woodwork. They are so built in, they are never stated explicitly that we forget that they are there. The one example that I've given earlier I've written about is exchange, the explicit assumptions that we write down about trade and exchange, that people must prefer more to less. Uh, preferences must be convex in the sense that there should be diminishing returns to scale. If you have these axioms, you get trade and exchange. But we know from experiments that ra rats satisfy these axioms, but we also know that rats do not perform trade and exchange. And the reason is that for trade and exchange, you need a whole lot of other assumptions, which are almost like norms in us, which are taken for granted. But the important thing is, these things can be discovered and these things can change. The biggest example of this in history, and this could be a very exciting research agenda, going below the surface and looking for the hidden assumptions of the discipline, because at one level, it does not re need technical expertise. It needs just the ability to see through things. The most celebrated example of this, and I will come to one or two examples in economics in a moment, is geometry. Euclidean geometry seemed like a perfect creation. Euclid wrote down the axioms explicitly, but there was one axiom in Euclid's head, which Euclid never wrote down, that the whole thing is being done on a plane. And later on, much later, hundreds of years later, it was realized that some postulates, the parallel lines postulate in particular, is critically making use of the flat surface. Which means if you are applying Euclidean geometry strictly to the sphere of the earth, you will begin to get wrong results. And at one level, we are lucky that the big breakthrough realizing that Euclid was using one axiom implicitly unaware that it's all taking place on a flat surface did get discovered in the early 19th century. The characters are fascinating from mathematicians like uh, Gauss, Euler, later Riemann comes in, but there was also a lawyer who was uh, involved in this, which is Ferdinand Karl Schweikart practicing lawyer who felt that there was something wrong. He subsequently becomes a mathematician. He ditches law and switches. So there are people, it is believed that Omar Khayyam uh, in the 12th century had a sense of Euclid having made use of an additional assumption without being explicit. In economics, you can see this in very interesting ways. And since Joe is here, I can give an example which Joe could have given better taking his example. If you take the arrow debro world that we are I just mentioned, 
the general equilibrium system. There you write down many of the assumptions explicitly, but there are also assumptions that you don't write down. And you begin to, after some time you take them for granted and students who are being brought up on that, it gets so built in that you feel that's the way the world is, there's nothing more to it. These are the only explicit assumptions. That there is perfect knowledge, that there shouldn't be knowledge asymmetries. These things are never written down explicitly. That's an assumption in the woodwork. There the deep insight is when you're not really worried about the axioms which are written down explicitly, but you suddenly realized that the ruling out of asymmetric information is an assumption in the woodwork of general equilibrium theory that we had, have inherited. And the early work of Joe Stiglitz, for instance, in the early 1980s, is a discovery of this assumption in the woodwork that actually makes dramatic changes to the way you begin to view the way the laws of the market come about. That is the kind of agenda that we face today. And of course, it's such a big agenda that in a closing talk, I can't get into this in any detail, but I'll tell you two areas where I personally feel that we need to uh, do research and uh, I will give you, um, uh, tell you what these two areas broadly are and then show how difficult this kind of a research can be by giving you a concrete example. I have a PowerPoint for the concrete example, but if I don't have time, I will explain that example in words. But let me tell you, first of all, that number one is that norms are critical. And what norms we treat as embodied in us, it's not written in stone. It's not a genetic code. It's something that we get habituated to. If you live in different cultures, like I've done living in India, living in the United States, you do discover little behavior in the marketplace, which are norms driven behavior, which are different in the two places. But we do need much better understanding of what these norms are and what we take one another expected. And I feel property right is a very good example that property rights, the way it's currently written down, we treat it as a fait accompli. It's dropped from heaven, that is not the case. We need to understand this. So a study of norms built into this is important. Another thought that I have had, and I don't think I have the capacity for this analysis is in reality, the general equilibrium on the side has another kind of transaction that takes place which earlier used to be very common among the very poor, but now it happens among the very rich, which is bilateral gift exchange. Among the very wealthy, among the people heading corporations, there is bilateral gift exchange takes place. So there is a market economy, but a market economy inside which there are some people striking bilateral exchange. And you can give very easy examples of bilateral gift exchange. If I'm an artist, and I give my painting to someone, I say it's a gift to someone, but I get back some returns from that person. I've basically done a bilateral trade with this person. I feel we need a general equilibrium theory with bilateral gift exchanges going on. And my hunch is you will get a dramatic breakdown of optimality results. The fundamental theorems of welfare economics will not work as soon as you have scope for these bilateral exchanges. It's a hunch, I'm not completely sure. Let me take the last sort of five uh, minutes I want to, to by getting into a problem that I've recently got into and written a paper, which is if you want to attend to these problems and if you're worried, and especially if you're coming with an ethical compass that in today's world, there are segments of the population, segments of people completely in the margin and marginalized. What do you do about this? And this will take me to one question, which again is, comes back to what was raised earlier, the meaning of the game of life. Uh, let me just give you one word on the meaning of the game of life, and then I'll jump into this example. Actually, I'll hold back the game of life. Let me get into this example. I'm going to do screen sharing. Uh, let me pull this in. Okay. Uh, 
Danny, uh, Joseph, I can see your faces. Uh, are you seeing my screen? If you nod, I'll know. Yes, we do. Okay, very good. So this is actually a, a paper that I've just recently uh, published, which is to do with if you have moral concerns. And by moral concerns, I'm not talking of religious uh, morality, but the kind of morality implicit in the uh, uh, remark by Danny and the paper by Joe, that grave inequality, um, inequities are unjustified, and we ought to do something about this. Here, I want to draw attention to the fact that if we, the game of life, the game of life is a game where People can do whatever nature allows you to do. It was Ken Binmore, I think, who coined the expression, the game of life, it's the ultimate game. Each of us can do whatever the laws of nature can allow. But actually in real life, the game that we play is circumscribed by a whole lot of norms and rules that we follow. But here is what I want to point out, that if two moral creatures, two creatures become moral and concerned about the poor and the destitute, in the end, they can actually do greater harm to the poor and the destitute. That is what this game illustrates. And I want to give you a glimpse of this because it forces open an analytical question, a kind of analysis economists do. How do you solve the problem of reaching out to the poor if Two individuals reaching out to the poor can make things worse for the poor. And I feel the world faces this problem and we have to take this on. I don't have a solution, but here is the result, which is a bit paradoxical. And I want to illustrate that. Suppose there are two individuals playing a game, which is illustrated over here. Person one is chooses between rows and has to choose between A, B and C. Person two chooses between uh, columns and has to choose between A, B, and C, and their payoffs are shown over here. I've taken an example where um, there is um, exactly one Nash equilibrium. It's a strict Nash equilibrium. Most of us would agree that really there is, if this game is played, this is the only thing that would happen, that Nash equilibrium. B, B is where the game would settle because B, B is where neither player can individually deviate and do better. So suppose these two players play this game repeatedly, they've settled that BB. Now, a Samaritan comes to town and tells these two people that, look, you're playing this game, but what you do, you're the rich, has a fallout effect on others outside of the two of you. Do you pay attention to them? And you say, no, we've been playing the game like the way economists tell us we should play the game. But the Samaritan draws attention to the fact that there is a bystander and the bystander gets payoffs of the kind just shown over here on this screen. The bystander does nothing. The bystander, depending on what these two players do, the bystander gets a payoff. If the two players choose A, the bystander gets 20. Two players choose B, the bystander gets six. Two players choose C, A, a four, etc. Which means when the two players play this game completely selfishly, selfishly meaning in terms of their own payoff, the two players get this as the equilibrium and the bystander gets a payoff of six. And this is where the Samaritan and even your conscience should tell you that these two players are super wealthy. They are getting $104 each. This bystander is miserably poor, getting $6. These two individuals, if they move to AA, for instance, they will get $102 each and the bystander will be much better off, still very poor, but much better off, $20. Surely these people should think about the bystander's payoffs. Suppose both creatures go moral, and moral in not the kind of way we write in textbooks, but the way moral human beings are, which is that you think about your own welfare. Of course, we are programmed to do that. My welfare, my immediate family's welfare, I'm concerned about, but I have a moral compass. I also weight the welfare of other human beings, and I would not do certain things if it is hurting them a lot. 
Okay, I'm going to formalize this a little bit. Suppose that player one now decides that I'm maximizing my payoff plus the payoff of the bystander. A dollar of the bystander is like my own dollar. And player two also begins to do that. A dollar of the bystander is my dollar. Then this payoff matrix will get changed to another payoff matrix where you'll simply each player's dollars add up the bystander's dollar. And if you do that, the game becomes a new game that you have over here where you've simply taken the old game and each player has added the bystander's payoff. And once you've done that, the equilibrium play shifts to when they are moral creatures putting a weight, weight of one to a poor person's dollar. My dollar and a poor person's dollar is the same. The outcome of this behavior goes to 110 each where the bystander is worse off. I call this game the Samaritan's curse that the two players going moral actually hurts the bystander. And I feel we have to contend with that whenever we see a bad outcome, we usually take it that the powerful people have all been bad. That's why we've got it. Very often that is the case. There are lots of powerful people who are miserably bad, but we have to keep our antennas up for the fact that good people with slight differences in a world can have devastating effect on the person who's getting the fallout. And we can even have this in a global landscape, two superpowers, both trying to look after their own welfare plus developing countries can actually do huge harm to developing countries. That's what this game shows. Where do you go? I feel where the game goes and this brings me back to the opening remarks. There is no such thing as the game of life. After seeing this, you don't sit back and say it's a fait accompli that the poor will suffer. We can step beyond this game and begin to talk and say that, look, despite our intentions, we are harming this third party and try to recreate the rules of the game so that when you come back to the gaming board after that conversation, this game has changed a little bit. We have decided that we can collude in favor of the poor and things like this. And that's the agenda that opens up once you recognize paradoxical results of this kind. Not to recognize this is, I think, wrong because we will keep wishing for the better, but with, in slightly different ways and we may end up delivering worse. Let me stop with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Kaushik. Uh, thank you, uh, Joe. Um, there's lots of questions in the chat box, but I actually just want to follow up a little bit on, on both your presentations and actually you know, take off from where Kaushik left. I think Kaushik's uh, you know, Samaritan's Dilemma example illustrates how formalization and thinking in terms of specific models uh, both um, can allow us um, to uh, uncover you know, hidden assumptions in the way that, that uh, you know, the use, to use Kaushik's term, uh, make explicit the role of hidden assumptions, um, as well as um, uh, inform us about uh, uh, consequences and often uh, um, um, unpredicted or surprise consequences of uh, existing, pre-existing rules or, or hidden assumptions. And then as Kaushik ended, I think the, the next stage is then to sort of see, say how in fact we might do better uh, in light of this framework, what would be a set of rules uh, that goes beyond simply um, just you know, adding up the, the monetary gains to each of the parties and redefining the game simply in that term, but are there other uh, rules um, uh, um, that might in, in, you know, involve communication, that might involve uh, different weighting um, of um, the, 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 the payoffs to uh, the rich and the poor that might actually uh, result in a, in, in a better outcome. In other words, what this sort of leads to is opening up the questions of our own institutional imagination uh, about thinking about different institutional alternatives. And that's the question that I want to, to, to pose to you and, and ask sort of what's the role of, of economics and economics instruction and economics research in this? My perception is that economists are very poor uh, at um, sort of 
this institutional imagination that too often we're just sort of lagging behind what policymakers are doing. For example, in the United States now, there are all kinds of rethinking uh, that is going on with respect to labor markets, with respect to monetary and fiscal policy and industrial policy, trade policy, bringing um, supply chains uh, home uh, with respect to even, you know, sort of the competition and antitrust policy. I, I'm not sure, so it seems to me that politics, you know, has moved much farther um, than economists' sense of the institutional alternatives and what the consequences might be or coming up with interesting solutions. I mean, do you share my, uh, my perspective that I think that, um, that, that, that in economics, we pay too little emphasis um, or pay too little premium on thinking about, you know, sort of taking this logic to the next conclusion, which is that if, you know, there are, you know, explicit rules, that if these rules can be written in differently, that different rules have different implications, then the logical implication is that there is virtually, you know, um, infinite variety of institutional alternatives, and those are not just you know, Scandinavia versus America, or it's not just, you know, um, 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 uh, you know, financial regulation a la 1960s versus financial deregulation a la today, uh, but there is a much broader variety. And, and what can we do to, um, to foster much greater sort of, th you know, um, thinking among economists about those alternatives um, that is sort of based on the kind of, of rigorous, um, well-rooted thinking? Um, that, uh, that in particular Kaushik's presentation um, uh, exhibited. Who wants to go first? Well, okay, let me, let me comment. I, I think you're, you are absolutely right. Uh, at the same time, um, economics is a discipline. It's a scientific discipline. The word discipline means that we put blinders on because we, we want to think rigorously um, Kaushik described, you know, assumptions. Uh, we want to be as clear as we can uh, about the assumptions. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, where um, uh, the discipline needs uh, to move is to think, why is it that people are think, uh, focusing on certain things that are left out of our model? Is it because they are thinking sloppily? Or is it because they actually are sensitive to something that we uh, have not taken into account? So, for instance, um, uh, one example in macroeconomics that uh, for a long time, the standard model in macroeconomics was a representative agent model. And uh, that assumption was a very, very strong assumption that precluded any concern about enforcement of contracts, any concerns about asymmetries of information, any concerns about financial markets. And uh, it, it, it provided strong discipline that enabled you to think rigorously, but it was so con confining but it, that it didn't address any of the issues that confronted our society. So that's an example where economists should have paid more attention to the real concerns of the political process. On the other hand, the obviously we would be uh, it would be wonderful if we lived in a world without resource constraints. And sometimes the political discourse ignores the constraints that it ought to and, and things that we, you know, that there are unlimited resources or it thinks at the other extreme that the world is a zero sum game. And those kinds of discussions in the popular sphere, which govern the institutional arrangements are ones that economists have to obviously uh, criticize. So it's, Trying economics is a discipline. We get benefit from that, but there's a cost, and that is the excessive narrowing, uh, the blinders that it puts on us. And Danny, if I may jump in, uh, so 
I, I think it is right that um, the conventional economics thinking really has these very severe caps, but uh, I don't think it is actually intentional. I think it does a lot of harm to be um, um, to make assumptions and then forget that you've made those assumptions. You do need assumptions to analyze, but to forget does do harm, and that's what I was referring to. But a lot of it is, of course, not intentional. A lot of it is what that is what normal science, to use this methodology of science uh, expression, normal science is about. So normal economics is really about that. You take these things as given and you analyze and then someone breaks it open and it becomes a broader discipline and you begin to do that. And we are at a juncture where I think you're right that the uh, discipline is trailing behind the nature of the world and complexity. And if we really take institutions as given and nothing can be done about it, we may hurtle into a dramatically bad outcome. So we need to get out of that. Very early, thinking has changed though. I mean, the writing repeatedly and reminding people that there is something that is broader and we have to be aware of that is changing. But if you go back, I'm going back to my early days, just after I had finished my PhD, when actually the neoclassical grip was much bigger on the discipline. A very, very simple question. I had returned to Delhi and used to ask mainstream economists, when you take a taxi ride in India, at the end of the taxi ride, it's very easy to run away without paying. Why do we not run away? And I remember this was really the standard answer given that if you tried to run away, the taxi driver would come after you and probably give you a thrashing. There's a probability of that. And that pain is so big that that's the reason you pay up. And it seemed patently wrong to me that that's not the calculation I go through when I pay the taxi driver at the end of the ride. And really, if that was the only reason why I pay the taxi driver, the taxi driver after I've paid should use the same threat that I'll do to you what I would have done to you if you had not paid unless you pay again. <laughs> so there are these fallacies that we get trapped into by virtue of very, very mechanical thinking. Having said that, I'm actually also echoing a little bit of what Joe is saying. It is a balancing act. I, I do also talk to people who will ask for the moon, not realizing that you have to combine the analytics with aspiring for the best. So we need well-meaning, well-thinking economists, which is maybe we'll never get it, but that's what we have to aspire to. At the, at, the, at the cost of going a little bit over our, our, our time, I'm, I'm just going to um, I'm going to um, uh, pick just two questions from the uh, from the chat box, and and uh, you can pick you can you know whichever one or both you want to quickly answer. One uh, question concerns um, uh, the, the nature of climate, the, the challenge of climate change, and what that means for for conceptions about the desirability of economic growth. Uh, do you think we should actually um, uh, drop economic growth um, as, as a desirable uh, economic goal in light of the finiteness of our resources and climate change? The second question is um, about uh, the nature of technological change and innovation, that it's driven by the needs of the advanced countries and, and developing countries don't have much say in that. What kind of a global policy regime uh, might make sense uh, to ensure that developing countries' uh, needs and preferences are also heard uh, when uh, um, that important global public good uh, technological change and innovation takes place. And that, those will be your also final words. Um, so any final word you want, you want to uh, add, uh, please do so. So again, let's go for, with Joe first. Uh, great questions. Um, in terms of the first question, um, the, uh, I think there's room for increasing standards of living. Uh, and it's very clear that we can increase standards of living without increasing our carbon footprint. Uh, we can provide better health. Uh, we can, uh, uh, we've achieved enormous advances in renewable energy. So the question is how you think about growth. If you think about growth as just an increase in material goods, we obviously have to circumscribe it. But if you think about it more 
broadly in terms of an increasing standard of living, there are ways in which we can have uh, a broadly shared increases in standard of living with uh, a uh, lower carbon footprint. And in fact, to put it very broadly, we can live within our planetary boundaries. Um, the second uh, question, I think, uh, it is really an, another really important question. Uh, technology is endogenous. We, uh, I've written a paper with Anton Kornak talking about steering technological change. But the way the advanced countries would want to steer technical change can be markedly different from the ways that are in the interest of emerging markets and even more developing countries. But knowledge is a public good. And so I think it is uh, in the interest, the collective interest of developing countries and emerging markets to get together and to work together to help promote the basic research that would help support the evolution of technology in ways that are consonant with the interests of the developing countries and emerging markets. I actually think it's in the advanced countries' interest that this be done and therefore that they should support the creation of that kind of a global institution. The reason why I say it's in the interest of the advanced countries is that there's going to be enormous migration pressure uh, from certain developing countries, uh, unless there are significant increases in standards of living, um, you know, particularly in, in, in Africa, but also in places in Central America, Latin America, uh, elsewhere in Asia. So uh, it is in the collective interest, the Good Samaritan that uh, Kaushik talked about, uh, it is in the collective interest um, of everybody. And the question is, uh, can we get uh, that kind of global collective action that is necessary to uh, uh, produce a global public good that will be of benefit to both the developed and the developing countries? Thank you, Joe. Um, Kaushik? To the first question, uh, no. I feel uh, there is really no need to rein in growth. It's the, and, and I, I suppose Joe was touching on something very similar. The content of GDP growth can change dramatically. I think most people uh, think of GDP as more consumption of standard goods, more cars, more homes, more yachts. But GDP is if you get a medical breakthrough that increases your longevity, your health dramatically. These things are components of GDP. We are willing to pay money to buy these things. So my hope, and actually I have a bit of an expectation also, is that our GDP growth actually may pick up the way it has picked up through the industrial revolution. We know that before and after that, dramatically faster the world is growing. We may be growing dramatically faster here onwards, but with the constituents of that growth being very different. We are in better health. We are taking in much more better music. We are taking in better art. We are getting philosophy. All the pleasant things are coming in for which we were willing to pay. We are getting it because it's easier to produce and we are consuming less of the products which are doing damage to the earth is possible. So yes, the climate change is a huge threat looming over our head, but to arrest that problem, it's not necessary that you have to stop growth. You have to stop certain kind of growth. To the second question, a technological change, uh, it is true that a lot of it, the way it takes place, some of it, you know, it's small individual's decision. It's not that everything you'll be able to control, but a lot of it is because of our nature of our patent laws, our rules and regulations, that we get the kind of technological change that we have. And it is true, the person who asked the question, that these rules are largely set by developed countries. And that's giving a particular kind of technological change. Here, uh, it is possible to change this and we must try to change this. And this, this has become more acutely uh, 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 and of a problem of an immediate kind with the COVID-19 crisis. With the COVID-19 crisis and the vaccine, the way the world has handled is just a reminder. It's a shockingly bad handling of the 
um, uh, this particular new invention, this is a one particular kind of breakthrough. And we have to go back to the drafting table on giving people rights. How do you get rewarded for, for what you're doing? And I feel on this, there is a big mainstream economics agenda, big broad-minded economists taking this problem of the nature of innovation and the nature of rights and patent rights that we grant through our laws. We have to understand this better and work together for getting a globally fairer set of rights. And in the end, of course, this, if we mishandle, it will come back to harm us through migrants coming in, through germs coming in, because they are mutating somewhere else and coming back. So it's in our self-interest. But even if it is not in our self-interest, we must learn to do certain things which are not totally in our self-interest, but in the interest of the world. So those are the two responses to the two questions. Danny, if I may uh, just, uh, this is the last day's uh, Congress. And I wanted to say a few things. So it's uh, not on our pressing economic problems, but just to welcome the incoming team of uh, uh, International Economic Association. And most importantly, I want to tell Danny, who is the president, has just become president of IEA, that uh, welcome to this. We've worked together. A welcome sounds like a silly uh, term because given that we've been working together very closely last couple of years, but welcome to heading the IA and taking this much further forward than I have managed to do. Eric Maskin, who uh, these are the newcomers that are other names that we knew I'm mentioning, who has just formally become vice president of uh, uh, IA uh, is in line after Elahan and Helpman uh, um, uh, to become president and welcome once again to Eric as a new member on the board managing this. There's Luis Felipe Lopez Calva coming in as secretary general. I hope this will be a team that will take this forward. Omar Licandro will of course be there as treasurer. I just want to thank Omar, Eric uh, Bergloff, um, and very, very importantly, who has been at every stage I've been calling up, Andrea Cavallo, who has been uh, managing a whole lot of detailed issues. Thank you very much. And just a final word to the EC members who are representatives of the regions, the new ones coming in. Welcome here, Raquel Fernandez, Takashi Kamihigashi, Harun Bhorat, Ufuk Akchigit, Mahendra Dev, Yao Yang. Come on board, I, 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 I'm still going to be involved and let's try to take this with the kinds of issues we were talking about today, IA forward to lead some of this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kaushik. And uh, I have very um, big shoes to fill, um, you know, two pairs of which are, are on, on the screen right now. Uh, that's going to be impossible uh, task. Um, I'm not going to go through a whole list of names. Thank you a lot, uh, Kaushik, for your guidance. But also, but let me echo in particular your the word of thanks you expressed to um, Andrea Cavallo, who's been uh, working very hard uh, behind the scenes to make this uh, virtual uh, Congress uh, the success that it has been. So I know, Andrea, you're somewhere back there. Thank you very much for everything that uh, you've done for this. Um, and, and with that, uh, let me close this session, uh, thanking once again Kaushik and, and, and Joe for, uh, for, for being with us and for your, for your views. And thanks to uh, everybody for, for joining us. Um, see you all soon, sometime, uh, somewhere uh, in uh, not too distant uh, future. Thank you and uh, goodbye. Recording stopped.